Next up on the program, it is my great and distinct honor to bring to you a gentleman I, I got to spend quite a bit of time with on the campaign trail. At one point, arguing against him, and then at the next point, actually arguing alongside of him against everybody else. How many of you remember the United States Senate campaign of Reverend Mark Harris from Charlotte, North Carolina? How many of you remember? And if you haven't seen it, go back and look at his uh, video library at the, at the church website and look at what he talked about on the 4th of July message that he brought. A powerful, powerful message, one that I hope you will share on social media. I did. He spoke eloquently and directly and honestly and with the power that you and I need to hear. And he's going to bring that same gift, that same talent to you right now here today. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you welcome with all of your heart to Joe Miyoki, my friend and uh, a man that America needs, the Reverend Mark Harris. Oh, Thank you so much, Bill, and thank all of you for coming out on uh, what is turning out to be a beautiful, beautiful Saturday, and I'm so grateful for how the uh, sun is beginning to come out, and uh, as people are continuing together, and what a great start uh, Bill Flynn has given us. I'm so thankful for, again, the visionaries that uh, continue to stay with the stuff and, and bring this gathering each year uh, here to Jamioki. And I just, indeed, my honor and privilege to be a part of it. In fact, I got up early this morning and made my way from uh, Black Mountain, where I've been a part of the Black Mountain retreat with the Lieutenant Governor this weekend. But uh, I'd already committed to be here. And so I told them I was going to leave this morning and head up here and to be a part of this event before I head back a little later on uh, this morning. But ladies and gentlemen, I, I made the journey and I made the commitment to be here because I do so with a greatly burdened heart. It's a heart that's burdened for our culture, a heart that's burdened for our churches, a heart that's burdened for our government. And frankly, I come to you today with a heart burdened for our nation as a whole. And, and I think the best way to express that burden, I, I would simply begin by stating that everything I want to share with you over these next few minutes is focused on getting us to comprehend one fundamental fact. Ladies and gentlemen, we are a nation with so much hope. We are a nation with so much potential. We are a nation with so many blessings beyond that which we could ever hope for, ask, or even imagine. But ladies and gentlemen, the fact is, we are a nation that is way out of balance. And I mean way out of balance. And the simple truth is that you and I no longer can take for granted that in this nation, the very basic and very foundational assumptions, please hear me now, common ground, common sense, and understandings about our freedoms and how we may exercise them are now eroded in our nation. I, listen, I wanted to make every effort to be at Jamioki with you today because I believe from the bottom of my heart that we are not merely in the midst of a crisis that will determine the future of our freedom and our nation. But please hear me, we are actually approaching the final moments of that crisis. Where do we find ourselves today? How are we so out of balance? You know as well as I do, we find ourselves out of balance economically. Our nation is struggling desperately because we are so out of balance. Our national debt is perhaps the most serious issue affecting our economy. It's affecting our foreign policy and it's creating an effect on the families of America and our entire social structure. 
You and I recognize that we cannot continue to tax and spend and spend and tax. We cannot continue to ignore the most basic and simple reality of math and money. You cannot spend more than that which you have. Amen. That's a reality. I don't know about in your house, but in my house, we have to set priorities. And until our leaders recognize this truth and manage to set an example for our nation by cutting our government's credit cards that are run amok, we will continue to economically sputter with no real job creation, no real tax reform, and no real season of economic prosperity. You say, Mark, can there really even be such a season again? Absolutely there can. But not until we become a nation that is in balance once again. You and I could look not only at economically how we're out of balance, you could look at the realm of foreign policy where again we find our nation out of balance. We find a nation where our allies no longer really trust our resolve and where our enemies seem to mock us and think of us as fools. When the Ayatollah Khomeini, not to be confused with the Ayatollah Khomeini of the 70's, when the Ayatollah Khomeini of Iran says to his nation and to Israel and to the world that in 25 years you Israel will not exist, God willing, and with our jihad and with our fighting forces you will live in fear day and night. End quote. When that nation's leader whom Barack Obama has assured will be nuclear armed within the next decade, mocks America like that, you and I must admit we are a nation that is so out of balance, it's no longer even funny. We're totally out of balance in our foreign policy. But perhaps from a government and a political standpoint, the greatest imbalance is perhaps the most obvious in the total disregard, I mean the total disregard that has seemed to take hold for the Constitution of the United States. When you and I think about the blatant, obvious political gymnastics that we are having to endure, when a nuclear deal, which everyone recognizes is a treaty, it smells like a treaty, it looks like a treaty, it walks like a treaty, it reads like a treaty, which means it should, and under the Constitution, require approval of the United States Senate. But not only do we not have the Senate voting, but when we thought there would be a vote, it was only to pass a resolution that we didn't like it. And to stop even such a weak resolution or at least guarantee the president's veto would be upheld, it only took 34 U.S. senators to believe and vote that it's a great deal and that it should not be stopped. Did you hear what I said? Only 34 out of 100 U.S. senators could guarantee it would not be stopped. May I ask you, whatever happened to majority rule in America? Whatever happened to the fact that 34 states had voted, and I mean overwhelmingly, the people voted that marriage is to be between a man and a woman, and yet five robed lawyers on the U.S. Supreme Court say no, and suddenly the media is sweeping the country saying same-sex marriage is the law of the land. And as crazy as it sounds, it gets even worse. Because as was pointed out last week at the jailhouse in Grayson County, Kentucky, we have lost our common sense and common ground because we no longer believe and operate within the Constitution of the United States. Any person who can read, reads the Constitution and knows that law is not made by the Supreme Court. Law is only made by the legislative branch be it federal or state, what five judges did, what 
whether you agree or disagree, whether it was right or whether it was wrong, whether you think it was good or whether it was bad, they simply gave a majority opinion that same-sex ceremonies should be legal and recognized. And yet I stand before you on this Saturday, September 12th, and I am still waiting to hear of the passage of such a law in the United States Congress or the state legislatures across this country. In North Carolina, we have a statute dating back to the 1990s which declares marriage is between a man and a woman. We have in North Carolina a constitutional amendment in 2012, which actually hangs in my office, by the way, signed by the Secretary of State, Elaine Marshall. And while the Supreme Court has issued its opinion on the issue, I continue to dare anyone, show me the law enacted by Congress or the North Carolina legislature which has complied with the Supreme Court's decision. And you know what? You can't. Because it does not exist. We are a nation that is so out of balance in our economy, in our foreign policy, in our treatment of the Constitution. But I want to leave you this afternoon as I wrap up with truly the most detrimental imbalance which many will argue is the root to all the others. And that is, ladies and gentlemen, I've come here today to declare to you that we are a nation which is spiritually out of balance in every way. In one generation, you and I have witnessed this country sliding from a nation who once shared a moral vision based on Judeo-Christian ethic to a nation floundering in moral decay. In one generation, we have watched our nation who once believed in lifelong marriages to the same spouse to a divorce rate now well over 50%. We have watched in one generation where homosexuality was once criminalized to now we see the criminalization of Christianity. And I could go on and on with the entertainment, with the education, with a life issue. But I want you to stop for a moment and realize with me that to a very similar culture in Isaiah's day, the Lord God of heaven spoke. And He spoke reality. It's been said that in the early chapters of Isaiah, and particularly in chapter 3, there are some nine documented transgressions against God that are listed in those early chapters, particularly in chapter 3. And then he not only lists those, but he actually shares, beginning in verse 4 and down, the results of the trans transgressions against God. When I read them, it was almost uncanny to me what God has stated so clearly. And I want you to hear what he says. You see, in that third chapter, he says in verse 4, the results of a nation that has transgressed against God, he said, I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. The people will be oppressed, every one by another and every one by his neighbor. The child will be insolent toward the elder and the base toward the honorable. When a man taketh hold of his brother in the house of his father, saying, You have clothing, you be our ruler, and let these ruins be under your power. And in that day, he, speaking of the brother, will protest, saying, I cannot cure your ills. For in my house is neither food nor clothing. Do not make me a ruler of the people. For Jerusalem stumbled and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord. To provoke the eyes of His glory, to look on their countenance witnesses against them, 
And they declare their sin as Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to their soul. For they have brought evil upon themselves. Did you catch what God said the results would be? Did you notice where I started? That He said, I'll give children to be their princes and babes shall rule over them. I got news for you folks. Young children hold no core values, but they simply emulate the actions of others. In other words, I'll give you a generation of politicians and no longer statesmen. A generation of politicians and no longer statesmen. He said in verse 6, not only will I do that, but apathy and personal comfort will rule the day. Even when you find someone who seems to have it together and have the clothes and you go to them and say, we need you. Please be our leader. And, and people say, no, I don't have time for that. No, I'm not going to get involved in that. No, I'm not going to spend my money on that. No, I'm not going to invest in that. And ladies and gentlemen, apathy and personal comfort rule the day because nobody's willing to step out and take the risk anymore. God says that's the result of this day. And then of course He said in verse 8 and 9 that was pretty clear. They declare their sin as Sodom and they do not hide it. In other words, in, in their day, perverted lifestyles came out of the closet and decided it was time to march down Main Street. Folks, I'm just going to tell you the truth. God will not tolerate wickedness forever. But listen to what he said in verse 10 as I close. God says in His Word in Isaiah 3.10, Say to the righteous that it shall be well with them. For they shall eat the fruit of their doings. <laughs> now that's supposed to bring us hope. You know? That's supposed to bring us encouragement. When we are told not to worry as righteous people because we will see the fruit of our doing. And of course what He is saying to you and to me is what we're already realizing, politicians in America will not preserve marriage. Politicians in America will not end abortion. Politicians in America will not reduce crime. Politicians in America will not improve education. Politicians in America will not reverse corruption. And politicians in America will never end immorality. No. None of the great moral and political issues you and I face today will be corrected until we experience an old-fashioned Holy Ghost revival and spiritual awakening in America. And, and, and wait, 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 before you clap, may I remind you, my friend, that will require Christians to repent of their sins. Hey, hey, before you clap, I mean specific sin. I mean specifically named. And I mean specifically repented of by each of us. For it's when that happens that we see personal revival. And that, my friend, always precedes national revival. And out of a national revival, I truly believe will come a corporate action. I can see it in my mind and I can see it in my heart and I pray for it daily. I pray, Lord Jesus, let Your church rise up 
together. Lord Jesus, let your church no longer sit by and watch infidels run this nation into hell. Yes, it is time to pray without ceasing, but it's also time to become the answer to our own prayers as we stand for truth and we stand for righteousness in the public arena. It's time for us to stand. God bless you and God bless the United States of America.